Howdy, folks. Um, nice to be here and a chance to talk to some of our students about some of the things. What I decided to do is I was just in Korea and did a, a series of talks at some places. I thought I would take that and build upon it and add a few things that we've been doing related to protein and exercise training and health to give you some background and some ideas about future research opportunities. So if you look at the International Society of Sport Nutrition guidelines for uh, nutrition for active individuals, uh, some of you know, may not know, but uh, I had the privilege of help co-founding that, that organization probably 15 years ago, I guess. Um, and I served as the founding editor-in-chief for the journal, and now I'm still the co-editor-in-chief. Uh, but one of the things we tried to do with ISSN is, is help people make good decisions based on science about uh, recommendations for athletes and active individuals. So uh, a few years ago, we started publishing ISSN review papers and guidelines for athletes, and they really have been the staple of uh, sport nutrition recommendations for many organizations now. It's interesting how other organizations have copied the format and things that we've done in ours, uh, and now are citing, uh, citing this, and uh, a testament to how well accepted these are. The NIH just did a uh, review of dietary supplements and listed most of our uh, seminal research on s several areas and our position stands as a rationale for the NIH to do and make the recommendation it did. So what I want to point out today is we're going to talk about protein. And for a general individual starting exercise program just three times a week, just basic fitness, they really don't need much protein, more than a normal diet. The RDA, as you know, is about 0.8. Uh, grams per kg, and you might need a little bit more. So it looks like this is acting up. Those that are involved in moderate training, maybe doing uh, three, four times a week, some consistent training, might get to the one to 1.5. Unless you're doing really heavy training, an athlete training two, three hours a day, or doing a lot of heavy resistance training, you typically don't need to get to uh, around two grams or so. But we'll show you some literature in a minute that actually have gone well beyond that and showing some interesting results. Strength athletes generally, a little bit less carbs, more protein. And in this case, for resistance athletes, we want to get them into two uh, gram per kg per day. And if they're at altitude, or doing two a days, or very intense training, they typically need to get into two, two and a quarter grams per kg per day. So those are the general guidelines. So what I want to do today is overview the most recent uh, ISSN guidelines for protein that came out this summer. This is a follow-up paper to our 2007 um, guidelines of the latest information, including some meal timing, bedtime, uh, protein needs, et cetera. Then after going through those and providing some of the literature, including some of ours, we give some examples of how this can make an impact on uh, exercise, training, and health. And then at the end, give you some overview of um, some nutraceutical and functional food type opportunities and research that's on the horizon. So first point from the ISSN um, is that an acute exercise stimulus, particularly resistance exercise, stimulates protein synthesis. We know that, okay? But it wasn't really until about 10 years ago that we knew that. And so uh, a few of the initial studies uh, were looking at how uh, exercise affects IGF-1 and insulin signaling, exercise affects mTOR, and then we found out that if you add carbohydrate, essential amino acids or branched chain amino acids, and in particular leucine, you may get a further stimulus of mTOR pathway, and this is the initial stimulus for protein synthesis. The theory is if you increase mTOR or some of the downstream regulatory pathway markers, you'll get an increase in protein synthesis. If you do that often enough with resistant training, you get more hypertrophy. That's the theory. So how do we start approaching this? This study we did at Baylor with uh, Dr. Colin Wilborn and his dissertation. We took 13 individuals, brought them in, and did very intense resistance exercise. Uh, in this case, they were doing two intensities, 60 to 65% and 80 to 85% different rep schemes on uh, lower extremity exercise. And we did biopsies before, after two hours, six hours after exercise. And we looked at a number of messenger RNA expression and uh, cell signaling patterns. What I want to show you here is, a, is that intense exercise acutely, this is uh, myosin heavy chain, that you get an upregulation of a lot of the protein synthesis markers. This is myosin heavy chain activity. Myogenic regulating factors are factors that will stimulate protein synthesis. And you again, the first two hours, four, six hours, 
really get a nice increase, stimulus from the resistance exercise. If you then look at some of the other pathways and growth factors, again, resistance exercise increases growth factors, and in this case, reduces some of the satellite cell formation, which is also a stimulator of protein synthesis. So exercise itself, good evidence, stimulates protein synthesis by the pathway mTOR and other uh, regulatory pathways. So combined with that, there's a lot of studies in the early 2000s looking at, well, how does amino acids before exercise or after exercise affect protein synthesis? And some of the studies out of uh, uh, Rasmussen's lab and, Phil and Phillips' lab um, show pretty nicely that if you infuse amino acids, you get a uh, improvement in muscle protein synthesis and a reduction in protein breakdown. And this was followed up with oral ingestion of about six grams of essential amino acids plus carbohydrate. Again, before and after muscle protein synthesis is increased with resistance exercise, and you also get some change with muscle protein. So this was the basis for providing protein before, during, and after exercise. There have been a lot of studies, I'll show you a few more, that have uh, looked at this type of, of testing to assess this. So we also were interested in how nutrients affect this pathway. And as I just showed you, exercise alone is a nice stimulator of protein synthesis pathways and myogenic regulating factors. What happens if you add nutrition? Looking at that pathway. Well, in this study, we looked at leucine and branched chain amino acids matched for leucine content. And we did the same type of heavy resistance exercise, muscle biopsies before and several hours afterwards. Uh, and this was Bill Campbell and part of uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Labonte's uh, uh, dissertation work they did when we were at Baylor. And we found that when you provide the amino acids, you get the stimulus with BCA and leucine, but it wasn't an additive benefit of just the leucine. You've heard that leucine's kind of the, the one that controls the mechanisms. I'm not quite convinced that's the case, but there's certainly some evidence to support that. And so we looked at a number of regulatory factors and found that generally you get this increase with exercise, a little bit more benefit from branched chain amino acids uh, and leucine, but not differential effect. And we found no effect on insulin. Well, if you look at the pathway, one of the factors that can affect this pathway is carbohydrate and insulin. So we then had uh, Dr. Maria Ferreira and Dr. Yuwa Lee do their studies, and they looked at um, how would, if we give a bunch of carbohydrate with the amino acids, would that then get this super stimulus to try to optimize this uh, nutritional timing? In this uh, case, they gave 30 grams of BCA, a lot of BCA, over prior to and during the activity, plus a lot of carbohydrate. We're truly trying to maximize this stimulation pathway compared to carbohydrate alone and uh, control. And what they found is that insulin glucose markedly increased. We got the insulin increase. So you think, hmm, got insulin, got amino acids, got pro boy, we're going to see this humongous increase in protein synthesis. And we found there's some general trends. That, yes, there were some markers of the pathway generally affected a little bit more than carbohydrate alone, but it wasn't enough to really say that there's a huge additive benefit. We also looked at uh, how this type of nutritional intervention affects myostatin pathways. And that's a pathway uh, you may have seen that if you block myostatin, you inhibit myostatin, you get this huge hypertrophy response in cattle. Well, people have tried to use that same type of thing with humans to get huge bodybuilders. And, and so we actually tested pathway. And at least the amount of amino acids and leucine that we studied didn't have an added effect on that pathway. So there's certainly data. Stim uh, exercise stimulates protein synthesis, and if you time nutrient intake around the exercise bout, particularly with carbohydrate, amino acids, especially essential amino acids, you can get this enhanced protein synthesis and a reduction in protein breakdown. The second point from the ISSN is you generally need about 1.4 to 2 grams per kg. Showed you that, data supported that. I'll give you just one example. Uh, here's a study by Mark Tarnopolsky at McMaster, and he showed really early on that if you take bodybuilders and endurance athletes and you compare them to normals, they need more protein. 
And what was interesting in this study, they actually showed that endurance athletes may need a little bit more than the bodybuilder. Interesting. But they both need more protein due to the exercise demands and the amount of catabolism going on with exercise. So that's really not too, too spectacular of a, a goal. Uh, the next position, Stan, is that you maybe get some benefit from higher levels than we typically thought. Uh, a few years ago, Dr. Bob Wolf, who was really the pioneer in doing a lot of this uh, pre- and post-exercise amino acid supplementation work on protein synthesis, did a presentation for Texas ACSM, and he showed the rock. And he was preparing for the Hercules role. And they did have him do diet, and he's like taking 500 grams a day of protein, okay? And people are like, what in the world do you need 500 grams for? Right? That's just waste. You're not going to use it. You're going to turn to fat. Right? Well, uh, Dr. Wolf actually calculated for that person of being 300 pounds of 8% or 10% body fat and doing that much training, if you look at the stimulus plus breakdown, he actually wasn't too far out of range, which opens up the opportunity that, you know, maybe there's a lot higher protein needs than we have thought about because we focused mainly on protein synthesis without looking at the anti-catabolic effects of protein or the uh, increased energy expenditure you get from protein, which can help with body composition modulation, okay? So uh, here's a couple studies that uh, Joe Antonio has been doing, and they've actually taken a look at high protein intake and gone well beyond that. And here's one of the studies they did. They took resistance-trained athletes, and they gave them either a control, 1.8 grams per kg per day, that's above RDA, about twice the amount of RDA, but it's kind of the low end for a lot of bodybuilders. I mean, most bodybuilders are taking more. And then they went way up, 4.4. And what they found was, and the theory was, that if you have lots of extra protein in your diet, you're gonna get fat. Well, what they found is, they didn't get more muscle, but they didn't get more fat either. In fact, they did a follow-up study where they went uh, three, 2.3 normal high protein for an athlete resistance trade versus 3.4. And what they found is there was some evidence of greater fat loss with the higher protein intake. Not necessarily more protein, but more, uh, more muscle mass, but more fat loss, which may be a reason why a lot of bodybuilders have very high protein diets. So more needs to be done with that, but it's kind of interesting. So that was a, a caveat introduced in the position stand. Then the recommendations are that you should optimize protein intake by having the timing before and after exercise to really take advantage of the exercise stimulus. And the general recommendations are that you get 0.25 grams per kg of good protein, quality protein, or about 20 to 40 grams. There's some people in literature who think that once you get to 20 grams, there's no extra benefit. I'm going to show you that's a little bit different now. And so here's a couple studies. One was uh, by a group from Woodard, and they looked at how protein synthesis was affected by different levels of protein intake. And they did very intense resistance training. They had them come in to do a high protein breakfast, then did a very intense exercise bout, and gave them either zero, 10, 20, or 40 grams of protein, and then looked at how the body responded to protein synthesis. What they found was that muscle protein synthesis increased above the baseline zero, just normal, normal food, normal carbohydrate, by 49 and 56% at the 20 and 40 gram level. But there wasn't benefit from the 10 gram, okay? They then looked at how, uh, and suggested that at least 20 grams is sufficient to get this protein synthesis, but maybe a little bit more could be used in some instances. Well then another study from McMartin's group came out and they interestingly looked at lean, low or small muscle mass versus the really hypertrophied person. Lots of muscle. To see if there's a little bit difference in how the body responds to protein synthesis and nutrition. And again, they gave 20 or 40 grams of protein in recovery after very intense exercise. And they found that the folks with the smaller muscle mass responded the same as the folks with the bigger, higher muscle mass. And they were, in this case, showed that 40 grams was the optimal dose. You see in the popular literature that your upper ceiling is 30 grams per, per, per meal. The literature really doesn't support that. And actually, if you try to do a literature search, there's nowhere you can find 
any study that actually says 30 grams is the upper limit. Interesting. Well, we've been doing some work with this. This is something that we just sent out this morning, actually, or last night. Uh, and this is uh, part of Tyler's dissertation. And we're looking at taking a protein bar that's 20 grams away and then adding a, a carbohydrate source that is low glycemic, it's a plant fiber, and trying to see if there are some changes with insulin and response. And what we did is we gave uh, uh, two different studies, uh, either 25 grams or 50 grams of dextrose. When you do an oral glucose tolerance test, typically the 50 gram dose is your basic dose. Sometimes you'll do 75. And you look at how the body's response to uh, glucose occurs after a standard load of carbohydrate. We then also gave the protein bar and looked at blood samples overall. And what we found is when you had this form of carbohydrate, which had a slow release of carbohydrate, glucose was much lower in both the high and low doses. Insulin, we found, was quite interesting, increased as much as having more uh, glucose in the blood. And it just may be due to the protein. So we did a follow-up. We did study two in part because we started thinking, hmm, that's pretty interesting. Why would you get an increase in insulin without an increase in blood glucose? It's usually proportional. So you would expect a lower insulin response. So we did the second study with a normal standard load. Again, we saw the suppression, less glucose compared to the, the control. And in this case, we actually saw that the higher protein intake, which is 40 grams of protein, increased insulin levels even to a greater degree, which then there's potential applications for resistance training. Because if I can get an increase in insulin, as well as amino acid provision, and some carbohydrate, I might be able to optimize recovery. So we're actually, that's part of his dissertation. We're gonna to try to do a, a intervention study where we do resistance training before and after on uh, carbohydrate versus the protein bar and try to see if we get an extra stimulus or greater recovery in athletes doing resistance training. So the key here is that even though glucose is only increased by 15%, that's the peak at any point in these two studies, they had a huge increase in insulin, suggesting that the amino acids may be playing a role in stimulating insulin. And there's some evidence of that, but not to that magnitude. Next point is that acute intake should have leucine. And the thought is leucine is the driver to the mTOR pathway and get a greater stimulus. And so you generally look for protein post-workout uh, or even pre to at least have two to three grams of leucine. Two is thought to be the minimum to get the stimulus effect. So what evidence is there? Well, uh, there's a study by Jakeman and, and colleagues that looked at giving either 5.6 grams of BCA or placebo after exercise. And that 5.6 grams is enough to have that two to three grams of leucine in it. Usually it's two parts leucine, one part valine, one part isoleucine. So it's like a, a match. And so uh, what they found is when they gave the, uh, the drink, there's greater stimulus of some of the mTOR pathway with the BCAA. Muscle protein synthesis was 22% higher. And that if you ingest amino acids alone after exercise, this is enough to stimulate protein synthesis. Again, they think it's the leucine. Another study by Dreyer and colleagues, then they looked at how giving essential amino acids with carbohydrate, again, trying to maximize that pathway. And they looked at uh, muscle protein synthesis and fractional synthesis rates. And what they found is that this amount, just amino acids and carbohydrate, is enough to stimulate the mTOR pathway and get this kind of extra protein synthesis. Some studies show that you get 200 to 400% more protein synthesis by adding the nutrients than just the exercise alone. So if I'm trying to train people, I need to optimize recovery to try to maximize the body's response to help them recover faster as well as to grow and get uh, stronger, depending on what the goals of the athlete are. So the next position stand is you should have a number of doses of protein throughout the day. Space it out. A lot of people have either no breakfast and then light lunch and big dinner versus some athletes will get make sure they have breakfast. We actually know athletes will wake up in the middle of the night to drink a protein drink. Dr. Willoughby, if you know Dr. Willoughby. Uh, and the idea is that if you have more frequent doses of amino acids, even while you're sleeping, 
you may be able to maintain protein synthesis at a more optimal rate over time. And so what evidence is there? There's a number of studies now coming out, mostly out of Florida State. And this study, they looked at 19 grams of a protein blend. This was whey plus casein, kind of a general milk protein. Uh, whey typically is uh, a faster releasing increase in amino acids, greater effect on muscle stimulus, casein slower, more anti-catabolic, okay? So uh, they did this study where they looked at the blend, which should be slower versus just the whey, which a lot of athletes do. And what they found is uh, that post-exercise synthesis rates were increased in both groups, but the stimulus initially was greater with whey, but it didn't last as long. So that it's almost like the hare versus the turtle. Over time, the blend worked better on protein synthesis. Hmm. You know, milk's a pretty good blend of natural occurring amino acids. Uh, another study at a lab showed that fractal synthesis rate, I think this is actually the same study, at rest, early, you get a big increase, blend versus whey, and so the entire four hours, actually the blend worked better. Then a, a group, Arcerio, has been doing some studies where they're taking people who have dieted, and one of the problems with dieting is you lose weight, if you lose too much muscle, the problem is that you, you end up regaining the weight again, okay? So keeping weight off is a real strategy. And so what they've been doing is taking people who have lost weight and then putting them on different types of diets where they provide protein more often, more frequent meals, versus just the normal activity of one or two big meals a day. And what they found is that if you pace protein intake, you are able to maintain body composition better just by more frequent meals with some protein in the meal, okay? Next stand is optimal time to ingest is likely up to the person, but around the workout's good. There is evidence though that it, your workout with uh, increasing intensity can increase protein synthesis as much as 24 hours. So we used to think, gotta have something right away, which still is a good, good recommendation, to optimize that window but what we're finding is as long as you have enough protein throughout the day in 24 hour period, you get the same result. So I'll give you a couple examples. Here's one study by Mike Bird who just uh, finished up and we took uh, women in the Courage program which is resistance circuit training and we timed their meals, one meal. So they had on the same diet, high protein diet, the only difference was we either gave them a shake right after the workout or we waited two hours and gave it to them later to try to see if we gave something right away optimized response. And we found there's a little bit of benefit from having um, actually delayed worked a little bit better in this study, waiting a little bit. And, but what was interesting is that protein synthesis rates were really maximized in these women that were on the higher protein diet. But there can be some potential benefits of, of taking the meal and nutrient around the workout, um, but more study needs to be done. Here's another study by a different bird and they did 15 grams of whey protein and what they found basically is that this synthesis, positive protein synthesis, seems to last for at least 24 hours. So as long as you get enough protein during that 24 hour period spaced out, you seemingly get the same effect, net effect, on protein synthesis over that time period. Next position stand. Uh, these type of products are convenient. So the main thing is they get the nutrients when they need to be. So using shakes and bars and gels and things like that are all ways to make it convenient for athletes rather than have to rush across campus, find a place to eat, order up what they need or whatever. Especially when you're traveling, got a busy schedule. So that was one of the conclusions. Uh, next conclusion is that rapidly digesting proteins which have more essential amino acids are the most effective in stimulating protein synthesis. And what this has to do is with the release of amino acids over time where essential amino acids generally stimulate protein synthesis quickly and then fade, whereas a lower blend, as we mentioned, or casein increases moderately, but it's sustained over time. We've done some studies with this. And a few years ago, we were one of the first ones to say, what would happen if we took normal protein powder and added some more 
supersize it, make more, put more amino acids in it, and glutamine. Okay, this was a product that uh, GNC came out with after the study called Superway. Okay, and we thought, you know, we can really get a better effect if we just take that whey protein and get some more. So we gave 40 grams of whey. Now, 40 grams of whey is the upper limit we showed you a few minutes ago that you can get this great stimulus on. So we're trying to see if you take what athletes do and add to it, fortify it, you get better benefit. And we did this study, it was probably um, 2002, three, and it was before we knew some of the responses that we've now talked about. And so when we did this study, it's an example of you think you're gonna have an effect in one way, but then you get surprised with the results. I'll give you an example. We did placebo, 48 grams. We did the super whey, three grams with BCA, five grams of glutamine. And then we thought, well, we have to have isonitrogenous comparator, right? So let's just give them casein. It's the same nitrogen. Let's just see what happens. It shouldn't have any effect because it's a slow. And what we ended up finding is the group that got the casein actually did the best. And we kept on scratching our head about this for many years until they started doing all these studies where whey goes fast, casein's the slow turtle, but over time, the turtle wins, okay? And so that's the same type of phenomenon. And the future studies then came out all support that this makes a lot of sense. So again, the blend works better than just the pure fast-acting amino acids. Uh, a couple other studies have done the same type of thing. In this case, they took whey, casein, or non-caloric drink and looked at protein synthesis. And you can see whey goes way up, casein kind of is slow, okay? Another study where they looked at uh, whey or casein combinations, and they looked at how this affects fractional synthesis rates. And basically, after you ingest a meal, the absorption retention is similar, but casein lasts longer, okay? Different types of protein can impact on the physiological responses. You all know about carbohydrates and glycemic index, right? You can have simple sugars that raise your insulin and glucose really high, high glycemic. You can have things like fructose or what we looked at, the uh, emulatose oligosaccharides, which are slow. Well, you're not gonna have the same physiological response. Same thing goes true with proteins. And so the type of protein you cho choose really depends on what your goal is. If I'm trying to maximize protein synthesis, I pick away. If I'm trying to do something where I have slow, steady release over time, like before I go to bed, maybe casein's a better choice, okay? There's also additive benefits that these things aren't taken by themselves. So let me show you a couple studies where we took protein powders, added things to them to get the supersize effect, okay? Example, uh, we took protein, 40 grams, and added carbohydrate. Different glycemic car carbohydrates, why? Thinking that a high glycemic with whey protein, I'll maximize insulin and protein synthesis compared to one that's a little bit moderate or low. And we found that yes, insulin is differentially changed with protein after ingestion. You get a little bit better insulin response if you take a uh, higher glycemic carbohydrate with your protein powder. We then looked at uh, taking protein powders, carbohydrate as a control, back in the day, gainer's fuel, 1,000, add 1,000 calories, drink, you're gonna gain weight, okay? And then early on EAS, they said, let's, what would happen if we took creatine and added it to a protein, carbohydrate protein drink, like metrics type thing, and what we get? We get phosphagene, okay? And so here we actually, is the first study with the creatine we did, uh, one of the first ones. If you're doing training, intense training, resistance trained athletes, just take carbs, you get a little bit of benefit. Gainer's fuel, 1,000, eh, you actually got a little fatter, gain all those calories. <laughs> but if you add creatine to the protein drink, much greater. We then said, hmm, that's really interesting. We then took football players in off season training, gave them nothing, placebo carbohydrate, Metrics, which was the biggest meal replacement uh, carbohydrate protein drink at the time. Also gained one, 20 grams per day. 
Phosphor gain two, 25, super. 84 days of supplementation. This is before we really knew that we didn't have to take creatine that much. But some people have asked me about what the best effects we've seen of creatine. Here we are. We're seeing nothing during training. This is a hypertrophy phase, obviously in training. You just give carbohydrate a little bit better, insulin stimulus, metrics, carbohydrate protein, a little bit better, but we're talking maybe one to two kg difference. You start taking creatine with your carbohydrate protein, you're getting three, four kgs. We had some folks getting 10 kgs, 20 pounds of muscle, and they ended up in the NFL. They responded very well to it, okay? Uh, we're celebrating our 22nd year of the University of Memphis football team beating Tennessee. And I just put this on our Facebook because somebody sent it to me. Those athletes were on creatine. That was the first year we started doing creatine. And after we beat Tennessee, number six, and Peyton Manning, we had a strength clinic at the University of Memphis. I don't know, you may have gone to that. And guess who was there? Every one of their strength coaches. What in the world were you doing? Okay. I then get a call from Nebraska. What is going on with you guys? Well, this is what we're doing. And Nebraska won three straight national championships, all taking creatine. Okay. Until the NCAA says, eh, that's not quite fair. That Nebraska will be able to afford that, and other people can't. But here's a great study that showed if you add just creatine on top of protein powder, you get effect. Here's another study we took, and we said, hmm, let's look at different forms of protein with creatine. And we looked at a carbohydrate alone, colostrum, a very high quality protein, got immunoglobulin or uh, uh, growth factors and things in it. It's a little bit of a very potent source of milk. Whey plus creatine, colostrum plus creatine. Placebo during training. A little bit of benefit, colostrum by itself, a little bit of benefit, colostrum with creatine, better benefit, or excuse me, uh, whey plus creatine, a little bit better benefit, and then you take colostrum with benefit, much better. We then said, what would happen if we took HMB and added it to protein and carbohydrate? Our initial study, this has been really well uh, cited, and people look at this well training effect with HMB, and they use it as a, one of the classical studies, one of the first ones done in humans, in athletes, and showing some potential benefits of HMB. What they often forget is we also gave them a carbohydrate protein powder at the same time. So the people that were on the placebo were taking normal carbohydrate protein and saw some decent gains. The people that got three grams per day of HMB on top of that protein, a little bit better, and the folks that got six grams per day, even more. Okay. Next position stand. Ingest quality protein throughout the day that have good sources of essential amino acids. And you can find a list of which types of foods have most of the essential amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, leucine, eggs, soy, white fish, parmesan. Pick foods that have higher EAA. Endurance athletes may get benefit. And we used to think, when I first started in exercise physiology, it's like, eh, endurance athlete, nobody needs more protein if you're an endurance athlete. They just need carbs. Carb, carb, carb. Carbohydrate loading, that's all you gotta do. And then we started doing these studies and finding out, boy, they break down a lot of protein. And they lose muscle mass during season. Competitive running, cycling, they'll lose 10, 15 pounds during six or three or four months of training. It's muscle not just fat, which suggests there's greater protein degradation. So uh, we actually did several studies back in the day, before you may have even been born, on uh, high intensity ultra triathlon performance. And we gave amino acids, the four, branch chains and glutamine, the four, about two grams, and every hour during competition with the carbohydrate drinks. And we found that when you added the amino acids, in this case a half Ironman triathlon we did in the lab, um, they had much less protein breakdown and they recovered much better. Like their nitrogen levels in the three-day recovery urine was much, much lower. This was one of the first studies on amino acids done. I remember we sent out the paper and the, one of the reviewers was like, there is no decent rationale why you would give amino acids to endurance athletes. And 25 years later, it's like, yeah, you were wrong on that one, okay? So that was one of our first studies. We then said, well, what would happen you did during training? 
and we took swimmers and gave them a couple grams of branched chain amino acids and glutamine before every workout and after every workout in addition to carbohydrate. 25 week training. And swimmers go through what's called overtraining. They titrate their training, go way up, way up, and then they go through a hell week where they try to trash them and get a recovery and bounce and try to optimize performance during conference meets or national meets. And so we took the swim team at Baylor, at uh, Old Dominion, and we looked at how the body responded. And one of the nice things we saw was that the folks that were taking the amino acids with their carbohydrate were able to have less cortisol and better testosterone levels. We also saw some of the markers of immunity were lessened, meaning they would have less susceptibility to sickness, and we actually monitored all that. So there was some evidence that if you took these amino acids, just simply had some before and after workouts, over training, you would see less sickness and other problems. The last one I'll mention is sleep. There's a lot of interest right now if you take protein before you go to bed. You remember the old wives' tale, the glass of warm milk before you go to bed? Actually, that's not a bad recommendation based on the science now. Milk is a little bit of carbohydrate, lactose. It's about 10, depending on how much you drink, 10, 15 grams of protein, 80% whey, 20% casein. That's why chocolate milk's a good recovery drink, okay? And so there's been studies like, well, what happened if you did, before you went to bed, had casein? Slow, easy releasing amino acid. And some studies out of Florida State um, have been looking at this overnight synthesis rates. And basically, if you have protein, in this case 40 grams, before you go to bed, in the source of casein, you might get this response that we're looking for, and over training it might be a benefit. So here's an example of a study. A uh, 12-week resistance training program, one group had 27 grams of protein with some carbs every night before they went to bed. The other group did their normal diet. Protein ingestion before sleep represents an effective dietary strategy to augment muscle mass and strength gauge during resistance training. I mean, all I gotta do is get my athlete to drink a glass of milk before they go to bed. Hmm. Another study took the uh, whey protein, casein, carbohydrate, and found the same type of thing, that if you give nighttime whey, casein, casein seems a little bit better. It elicits this extra response. So over time, it may make an impact. So how does this affect health? Well, we know that as you get older, your protein needs increase. Why? You don't absorb protein as well. You often don't pick foods in the diet that are as high quality of protein. And so as you get older, uh, we know that you need about 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal in aging to help prevent the sarcopenia and loss of muscle mass as you age, okay? Uh, there's also suggestions that they may benefit from the things we do with athletes, the carbohydrate, the amino acid. A lot of the drinks that are uh, marketed to elderly ensure, okay, all those type of things are trying to prevent muscle mass loss by providing amino acids, in some cases HMB. Well, I'll just mention two amino acids that have great effect on health, at least we're finding. Uh, one, obviously, is creatine. And I didn't show you hardly any of our creatine studies, but we were one of the first ones in the United States to do creatine studies in athletes. And now it is morphed into this huge research on medical aspects of use of creatine. And if you haven't seen it yet, I highly suggest taking a look at the position stand we came out this summer. It not only talks about the uh, exercise and training benefits of creatine for athletes, but talks about the other things you don't think about. Things like reducing risk for spinal cord injury and brain trauma and enhancing recovery and glycogen synthesis for athletes. It also cover, uncovers and describes all the medical literature that's been going on with creatine. And here are some of the groups that have been studied. Neurogenerative diseases, dystrophy, Parkinson's, Huntington's, diabetes, osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, aging, uh, giving creatine before a person might have stroke or uh, is susceptible to a heart attack, reduces ischemic effects. Adolescents in depression give creatine while they're taking certain dep antidepressant medications to get better outcomes, less suicidal incidents. In pregnancy, 
we're, you're probably going to see in the next five years, and you know, instead of folate, you worry about folate ingestion when you're pregnant, we're going to talk about how creatine is important because the placenta and the child uses that creatine from the mother, so the mother needs more creatine in the diet. And they find that if infants or animals are born with low creatine levels, they have a much greater risk to blue death, the cord asphyxia. Uh, and so if they just simply add more creatine in the diet, their risk for birth uh, challenges are less. And they're looking at neurodevelopment neuro and finding some benefits, particularly in kids that have some neurological deficiencies. So creatine simply can have a huge effect. Then one final one I'll mention with our colleagues in our uh, Human Clinic Research Center. You know, we started doing research on HMB in the 1990s. And like creatine, it's now gone into the medical aspects. And HMB is a very good anti-catabolic amino acid. And so if you are doing intense training or in the hospital where you're losing a lot of muscle mass, Having HMB can slow that progression or slow that sarcopenia down. So uh, they've done a number of nice studies with this, and here's one of the outcomes. They took a huge multi-site trial where they gave standard care or amino acids plus HMB in patients hospitalized for heart failure, myocardial infarction, pneumonia, COPD. Nice end size here. Two servings a day, simply drinking a amino acid drink with HMB. And what they found was that the 90-day mortality rate, how many survived 90 days later, was significantly improved when you took the protein and HMB by about 50%. And so compared to placebo, HMB and high pro uh, protein drinks improved mortality, improved recovery uh, market, like 50% better, okay? Simple application of nutrition to try to treat a known problem. So what are the opportunities for you? There's gonna be more opportunity to do protein and looking at sport nutrition and particularly health. We're just still learning about what type of amino acids, what type of protein, what type of conditions may be beneficial. We haven't yet gone and take a look at too many studies looking at disease populations other than like sar sarcopenia, okay? Identifying optimal sources of high quality protein that contain high essential amino acids may affect training. You're gonna see the industry trying to identify newer and more unique sources of protein. You may have heard now there's pea protein out there for vegetarians, okay? The industry is trying to look for different novel forms of types of proteins the consumers may be interested in trying, and then testing effects to see if they work as well. There's even bug or insect proteins being sold. Okay? Let me have an energy bar with insect protein. I don't know. Crickets. Crickets. Um, and then you're going to see there's opportunity to expand to clinical populations as well as quality, adding quality amino acids to functional foods. Last one. There's going to be more opportunity. Um, I guess this is a repeat, except I had more detail. Uh, opportunities to expand clinical populations, identify ways to optimize bioavailability, protein blends, isolation, derivatives of amino acids, and with probiotics. What are probiotics? Yeah, it's, um, well, there's prebiotics, which stimulate the normal production of bacteria, friendly bacteria that can help with digestion. Probiotics are bacteria that are produced to consume to help with digestion. Well, if I take protein with a probiotic or any other nutrient and I enhance test absorption, I make enhanced bioavailability and function. So you're gonna start seeing some studies where they take the typical protein, whatever, add a probiotic if we optimize the impact, especially in elderly people. And then find ways to add more protein, quality of protein, amino acids to functional foods like they did with Insure by adding HME. Okay? Thank you.